and yeah, I'm so happy that you're all, he all here to see so many uh, familiar faces and, and names, um, and also many unfamiliar ones, actually. Um, it makes it even unbear more unbearable to, that we cannot share a gla glass of wine tonight uh, together, <laughs> but so it is. Um, I will start our exchange of these two days with uh, what is a mix of an um, in memoriam and an opening of this uh, symposium. In one of his last video lectures before he died, a Q&A with Latin American scholars, Jean-Luc Nancy asks himself the question, how to think the end? How to think in light of the end, facing the imminent end of existence as such, of his own existence? It is, he explains, the ultimate uncertainty, the ultimate unpredictability. It is like thinking in the dark. Suddenly his eyes start to twinkle as always when he realizes how things fall into place. He closes his eyes in front of the camera, moves his fragile body a little bit closer and stretches his speckled hands tentatively towards the camera. What do we do when we are left in the dark? He asks with his, eye, with his eyes closed. Il faut apprendre à être dans le noir. We have to learn to be in the dark. We have to learn it by touching our surroundings, stretching our arms by a form of thinking that is tentative, tactile, tatunante. This is how I feel now Jean-Luc Nancy is no longer here, left in the dark, trying to make sense of it, trying to make sense of the sudden deathliness, the sudden silence, the sudden immobility that started to permeate his text from one moment to the other. Trying to make sense of the unbearable realization that we cannot continue our exchanges. The many, many meals and meals and moments that we shared since we met 15 years ago. I don't think this transformation is so visible, so tangible with other thinkers who passed away. There are thinkers and texts that already have a certain immobility over them, even while, the, while their creator is still alive. But Jean-Luc is or was a philosopher of life in all its forms. Now, these texts are living, breathing beings. So how to touch upon the life, the lifeliness of his work, of his thinking, after the 23rd of August, the moment when Jean-Luc Nancy, at the age of 81, died. How to be in the dark, how to be, to exist in the dark with him, how to share his finitude. Perhaps we need to take recourse to a thinker of death rather than life to guide us on this posthumous path. I'm thinking of Maurice Blanchot, one of Nancy's lifelong interlocutors, though perhaps not the closest one, no doubt because Blanchot is indeed a thinker of death rather than life. So what does Blanchot teach us? Regaining or touching upon life after death or in death, Blanchot says, is not a matter of hoping for resurrection, of praying that the deceased one will return on earth, living and breathing in full glory. It is rather a matter of descending into death, like Orpheus descends into the underworld to reach for his, his beloved Eurydice. Of course, it is Orpheus's job as a writer, a poet to save Eurydice, from obscurity, from oblivion, to bring her back to the light of the day and to give her form, shape and reality in that day. 
And of course, we will do so in the upcoming two days with Nancy. But bringing the deceased back in the light of the day is not Orpheus's primal concern, according to Blanchot. His primal concern is to see her in her passing, to touch upon her absence. He wants to see her, I quote Blanchot, not as the intimacy of a familiar life, but as the foreignness, l'étrangeté, of what excludes all intimacy, end of quote. Indeed, descending like Orpheus into the underworld in order to touch upon Nancy's passing, we have to search for his absence. Not scare away this uneasy, transformed presence with a flashlight or brusquely taking it by, it ar by its arm and leading it back in into our usual academic and personal lives. But tentatively touching upon the dark without being able to predict where this will lead to. We will have to look for Nancy with our eyes closed, stretching our arms to touch rather than grasp. This is why Blanchot calls Orpheus's famous forbidden look at Giudici, a gaze and not a look. According to Blanchot, both looking and not looking at Giudici would betray her nocturnal condition. Instead, gazing at her in the darkness is the only way of seeing her, touching her as she is, absent, untouchable. The only way to ever come close is to throw what Blanchot calls a wraithless gaze, stealthily, furtively, indeed, as if with the eyes closed. In doing so, Orpheus, that is I and we, touching upon the lost one, are no less dead than he is, Blanchot says. But here Blanchot's posthumous path leads us away from Nancy, I think. For for Nancy, we are as alive as he is, as he still is. This becomes clear from the lecture given by Nancy in memory of Blanchot's death in 2003. In this lecture called Blanchot's Resurrection, like in his other readings of Blanchot, Nancy generously follows Blanchot's line of thought, but only to gently redirect it in the end. Both Blanchot and Nancy would say that what is touched upon, or even resurrected indeed, in the Orphean gaze, is not the one who died, but death itself. But what does it mean to say that death is resurrected? Whereas Blanchet would stress that it is neither dead or alive, for Nancy this means that death becomes a living thing, tangible, stroking or rather evading our hands, stealthily, unpredictably. Reading Blanchet against the grain, Nancy holds that the tentatively touching gaze, I quote Nancy, is not a crossing of death, une traversée de la mort, but death itself as crossing, as transport, and as transformation, revealing the most precious point of life." End of quote. This most precious, indeed most living point of life, revealed in death and by death, is, I quote Nancy again, the infinitely simple and indefinitely renewed, indefinitely rewritable, experience in us of being without essence." End of quote. This indefinitely renewed and rewritable experience of being without essence, of the crossing of death in life, as life, is in Nancy's case also always the personal experience of being a grafted organism the receiver of a heart transplant. At the age of 51, Nancy's first heart stopped beating, 
and he was to undergo the major and decisive operation of a heart transplant in order to survive. An operation that did not fail to trouble him regularly in the rest of his life. Nossi, in other words, is not a Eurydice who suddenly lost life, but is a grafted life that in life, as life, was already traversed by death, bearing its trace in the form of an interrupted but continuous beating of the heart, of more than one heart, of the most intimate sharing of finitude between mortal beings. It is a life that, as life, in order to live, already exceeded beyond itself, opened itself in the most intimate way to what exceeds and surpasses. This most precious point of life revealed by the crossing of death is, we all know, the fundamental disposition of being with that Nancy unremittingly brought to the fore in his life and work. It is also in this sense that Nancy's work, his thinking, has already crafted itself on us, intruded our uh, lives and thoughts, helping them to grow and transform. If not, we wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here today. Tentatively touching the crossing of Nancy's death, we also touch upon ourselves. So what is it that Nancy's work has transplanted in our collective thinking? In what way has he traversed it? I'd say that he has above all provided us with a new and challenging ontology. His philosophy of life, of being with, has no doubt most firmly altered our modes of thinking. As a reader of Heidegger, Nancy was interested in the most basic of questions the question what it means to be in the world. Avoiding all forms of essentialism, the answer to that question could only lie for Nancy in the each time singular, non-generalizable manifestation of a being with. Coexistence, co-implication, communication, sharing always precedes essence. Or rather, as he has it in Le Sens du Monde, coexistence entrances essence, traverses each essence and deprives it of its essentiality. End of quotes. The relation is primal here in a more rigorous sense than we find in many other relational ontologies. Especially in his early works like uh, La Communauté des Evrés, his, this relational ontology led Nancy to rethink the meaning of the word community and in its wake the meaning of politics. And he has done so in such a way that thinking being in common, that is within a group, a nation or a world, no longer needs something like a common being, an essence, identity or ground but needs in fact nothing else than the mere fact of sharing existence, of being together. There is no community that precedes interrelated individuals. There are only quote and unquote, some ones and some other ones, or some ones with some other ones. Community in other words, is all about this with and this and, a with and an and that manifests itself each time singularly as a singular plurality, a being singular plural as one of Nancy's other main book titles has it. Shifting our attention from the communal hope of sharing an essence to the way we share being each time singularly, Nancy also shifts our attention to the corporal aspect of that being. Our being in the world, Nancy holds, is first of all a bodily affair, an exposition of bodies to other bodies and of their mutual touching. 
as he explains in Corpus, everything that exists, animate, inanimate, exists in a bodily fashion. To exist for Nancy is literally to stand forth as a body, to weigh with your body upon other bodies, skin upon skin. Interestingly, this focus on the bodily side of being prepares a thorough rethinking of Christianity, one that does away with the dualistic image of a material worldly world on the one hand and a divine unworldly realm on the other hand. The Christian God becoming flesh that is emptying himself of his divinity to incarnate himself in the world has, according to Nancy, freed the world of its divine outer realm, leaving us with nothing but this world here, this fleshy world of bodies that are exposed to each other rather than to some divine beyond of the world. This is what Nancy calls the deconstruction of Christianity, or rather its self-deconstruction, implying that Christianity in principle boils down to a form of atheism. Beyond or rather through this rethinking of Christianity, of ontology, of community and the body, Nancy has provided us with an important and far reaching reconsideration of the concept of meaning. Asking himself what remains of the question of meaning when adopting a relational bodily ontology of being with, he cannot but conclude that our traditional views concerning meaning are in need of revision. For how to speak of meaning when there is no syntactic arrangement? Is there another meaning, one that corresponds to our everyday sharing of the world without being a poor substitute of the grand and brilliant meanings that we have embraced up till now? Yes, there is, Nancy assures us. And the notion he puts forward is the notion of sense. Being the central word in the philosophical lexicon of Nancy, sense encompasses sense in all its different senses. Our five senses, sensuality, sensitivity, direction. The world, as Nancy famously puts it in Etre Singulier Pluriel, does not have sense, it is sense and makes sense in our exposition towards each other, in sensing each other. This ongoing circulation of sense between us, I quote, goes in all directions at once, opened by presence to presence of all things, all beings, all entities, end of quote. Shifting our attention from generalizable and decodable meaning to the endlessly circulating, ungraspable, excessive sense of the world, it is no surprise that Nancy attached great value to the arts, not to one particular art form, but carried away precisely by their singularly exposed sense to a whole spectrum of different art uh, forms and artworks, from Christian painting to modern dance, from poems by Hölderlin and Conrad Eichen to the cinema of Abbas Kjaustami. Sometimes I think that if it weren't for the lifelong division of roles between himself and Philippe Lacoula Bart, the latter identifying himself perhaps more, or at least also as a man of theater and literature, whereas Nancy would readily identify himself as a philosopher, pur sang. If it weren't for that division of roles, I think that Nancy might have sooner developed creative ambitions as well. The joy he had in acting, for instance, is so obvious from the way he performed only a few months before he died. Um, <clears throat> Goethe's friend's lens in a film shot by Rudolf Burger to be found online. 
I've only touched upon some of the main themes in Nancy's work. Um, the many-sidedness and immense vastness of his oeuvre, encompassing about 150 books, makes it certainly difficult to get a grip on it. Nancy's work, so much is clear, does not have the logic of a philosophical system. Nevertheless, there is, I'd say, one very clear impetus motivating all of his work. One pulse, as one would say, as one could say, one pulsation or drive, and this is love. The love for wisdom, certainly, philosophia, but not the moderate, deliberate, balanced love of the assiduous thinker, not that kind of love, but rather passion, the crushing, quirky, physical love of amorous passion. If there is one intuition motivating his work, I'd say that it is the intuition that to be, to exist, and therefore also to think, and to think being, should be an act of love, of an unpredictable, vulnerable movement of absolute exposition. In love, we are two. Nancy writes in his Petite uh, Conférence sur l'amour. And from the moment we are two, everything changes. This also explains why this work, his work, is so personal and tends to touch in a personal way. Reading Nancy is not a transfer of information. It is an experience of being addressed being spoken to by this singular voice, oftentimes also from the first person perspective. And those of you who knew him personally know that this extended well beyond the confines of his works, in his tireless willingness to exchange, a repositioning of his body when being addressed, an amused smile, the immense joy at a real exchange of words, of looks. He was, he is, not the kind of person that wraps itself in a nocturnal veil, descending towards the underworld, patiently waiting until someone, me or you, asks him to follow him, to follow the way back up. He is the kind of person who actively reaches out to you, who calls your name from whatever region, who has already done so. I have used your name, Nancy wrote me, wrote me some time ago. He had to give a talk about Descartes and wanted to compose a fictionalized letter to Descartes, supposedly written by Descartes' great granddaughter the one that issued from the love between Descartes and Descartes' Dutch mistress, his beloved Helena Jans van der Stroom. History doesn't tell what their great-granddaughter was called, so Nancy wanted to give her my name, writing as if it were from my perspective. This is typical for his mode of thinking, his mode of being, using you, of course, not without permission, to move beyond himself, thinking through with your existence, letting himself be taken by it, connecting his life and language and place to yours. No need to gaze over one's shoulder to catch a glimpse of Jean-Luc Nancy's passing. He is already under our skin crafted onto us, his voice already reson is resonating in our voices. So to, con to conclude, what did Jean-Luc make me, the fictionalized me, say in that letter to Descartes, to the great grandfather of modern philosophy? I quote, I think, therefore I am, and loving, is still thinking. It is sensing and desiring and imagining. And first of all, 
enjoying. So let us in these two days enjoy the infinitely circulating thinking and share all the different ways in which it has marked us. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very stimulating talk. Does anybody have any questions? If so, please use the hand raising feature in the reactions button. Yeah, I see a question by Ian. Oh no, this is a clapping hand. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, Anne, please. Hi, hi, everybody. And thank you for that beautiful, beautiful talk. Okay. I was really interested in your opening move uh, when you described Nulsi talking about darkness. And I, it occurs to me that motifs of light and darkness are not very common in his work. Is that true? Or can you think of other places where he talks about light and dark? Because of course, we think of him as being the philosopher of touch. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, to be honest, I didn't really think about uh, the darkness as a theme as such. I think it, it, it is very present um, in analogous forms in his work in terms of, of ungraspability. So being left in the dark, so to say. Uh, but the literal, more visual distinction between light and darkness is not indeed not that present uh, in his work, although it is present in his dealings, as, indeed in this text um, dealing with Blanchot's resurrection, or ent being entitled Blanchot's resurrection, but de dealing with the theme of resurrection as such, um, and also the Christian theme, uh, the Christian motive behind it of yeah, re resurrecting from the darkness of the th tomb towards the light, let's say. Um, and there, in that, uh, he deals with it in the text uh, on Blanchot, but also in uh, Noli Me Tangere, the little book on Christian painting. Um, and there, he discusses these paintings that are created uh, of the scene of uh, Christ resurrecting from the tomb and being met by uh, Maria Magdalena who at first only sees a gardener and then later on discovered that this is uh, yeah, Christ resurrected. And the, most of the paintings deal with the, the kind of undead, half dead, half alive status of, of Christ revealing him a little bit in the dark. So, so there is where Nancy deals with this theme of light and darkness. Uh, but, but even more than that, he deals with the fact that the, with the, the kind of dance of um, movements and looks and touches between the two of them, between Christ and Ma Maria Magdalena. So it's a, a lot about the liveliness of that meeting, let's say, of that encounter, rather than uh, darkness playing, playing a real role in that. Yes, George's. <laughs> My uh, infinite thanks as well. What a great op opening uh, of, of this discussion. I, I also would like to add that uh, as opposed to drawing, which I think is the um, limit between form and formlessness, uh, painting is the limit between light and, and, and darkness. It's one way of uh, him. I think he phrases that in, in different uh, works as well. So a kind of a liminal negotiation. But uh, I had actually a question um, for you, for really anyone. Uh, my experience of Nancy was his um, great serenity, his great tranquility, uh, an exceptional calmness that I've not seen anywhere. Um, would you like to say something about this? Um, As opposed to the kind of quirky, passionate version that I gave of <laughs> I, yeah, maybe. I think they, they exist simultaneously. It, 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 
does remind me of the characterization that Alain Badiou gave of, gave of Nancy and of his work, but not only his work, also his personality in uh, this book, um, what would the English title be? The Adventures of French Philosophy, I think, so with chapters on different contemporary French philosophers, and, and the one on Nancy is called Une offrande réservée, so a, a reserved form of offering. Um, and I think I was a little bit puzzled by it in, in, at first hand, but I think in the end he's right in describing Nancy's attitude, both as a person, but also in his work as reserved, um, uh, touching upon the, the kind of serenity that you evoke, I think because he's not the kind of person, also not in his thinking or his mode of thinking, who imposes himself. He does not impose anything. He doesn't even um, invite you to follow him or invite you, to him, invite you to follow his line of reasoning, let's say. So it is really, in that sense, I think, a, a form of yeah, reservation that it's, it's completely up to you how you take it, what he has to offer. It is an offering, it's a very generous offering, but not an offering that he uh, it, in any form wants to impose on you. Um, so, and, and that I would say, uh, saying that it is simultaneously true, true that he is very passionate and um, outgoing, let's say. Uh, I think exactly this, ge this gesture of offering without imposing is, a gest is the gesture of love. The, 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 the expression, I love you, is not, cannot be an invitation for you to love me back. It cannot be. It is an expression, an opening, uh, a gesture, and it cannot be more than that. Or, or this is already everything that you can give, actually. So it's, it's in that sense, I think, yeah, necessarily both passionate and out outgoing and serene and, and reserved. Okay, for one one uh, quick question, and we'll have to move on. Yes, uh, Savannah. You're muted, uh, Savannah. Thank you very much for the the talk. Very beautiful, very moving. Um, and I was reminded. Uh, maybe it's not a quick question, but I was reminded uh, of the. A radical refusal of mourning that comes from Derrida. Um, this idea that the, the, the travail uh, of death should never be over. Somehow one carries on the melancholy of the other in oneself. So I was wondering how would you somehow put together the joy uh, that you were somehow giving us so strongly and also this idea of melancholy. Yeah, I, I think that Irving will touch upon this theme actually uh, in this lecture because uh, he will touch upon melancholy. So I will answer very briefly and also because I, I don't have the answer, uh, to be honest. Um, I think for me, it is very difficult to, to think of Nancy and his work in terms of melancholy or mourning exactly because he is a thinker of life and even in death the most deathliest point of death he sees is actually the most precious point of life uh, so it is yeah I, I'm very curious what Irving one will make of it but uh, so I think it's uh, it's yeah it is for him really the limits of, uh, of what can be thought and also what should be thought. Thank yeah. you, thank yeah. you, Susan, thanks. Thank you.